Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm, shalomhill.org. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Sometimes when you have two people in the same family that like plants, you get a difference of opinion not only on the plants themselves, but also on how to care for them. As you can imagine, Tom and I have discussions quite often regarding plants and pruning in our yard. Come along as we learn about pruning and how to do it right. ago we learned that planting a tree was as easy as one, two, three. Then last year we covered how to take care of a tree, four, five, six, so we don't have to pick up dead sticks. I'm Mary Holm, host of Prairie Yard and Garden, and today let's do seven, eight, nine, pruning to keep that new tree looking just fine. Welcome Gary. <laughs> Thank you Mary. You are so clever. I love that. <laughs> seven, eight, nine. It's always good to be here. Tell me, what is developmental pruning? What does that term refer to? Well, first of all, it's part of arboriculture and not of forestry. If people take a walk in the woods and if they think somebody is out there developmentally pruning trees in a forest situation, well, that doesn't happen. It just happens naturally, branches fall off. And that's because we look at a forest as a system rather than individual trees. In urban forestry or, or landscape uh, forestry, we look at trees as what kind of value can they add to quality of life for people. And probably the, the thing that we're most concerned with is, you know, whatever value they add, they have to be safe or pose the least uh, amount of risk as possible. So developmental pruning then is pruning a tree starting from when it's very young to an establishment period, which is usually about 10 to 15 years after it planted, and making sure that you're developing a strong, well-branched tree that is going to add to the quality of life for the landscape and the people that live there without becoming a dangerous tree that breaks apart in a storm. So that's what developmental pruning is. So what do you mean by a nice branching or anything? I mean, what, what does that mean or how does that look? A property owner, a tree owner, will see from the outside is uh, even though this is kind of a narrow angle, you, you key in on this. this. This is called a branch bark ridge. This is telling you it's a strong branch attachment. Now, if you, uh, if you have a bandsaw and uh, lots of time and no social life whatsoever, then you can do things like this. <laughs> And by, by opening this up, this is a really good way. Uh, don't, by the way, don't do this with your tree. Um, <laughs> but this is a good way of, of showing how um, this is really solid wood attachment here. So this is really the hallmark of a well-attached branch. Pay no attention to the angle of attachment. Look for the branch bark ridge on the outside. And trust me that to the inside, you're going to have the solid wood to wood attachment. That's a good attachment versus something like this that from the outside 
even though there is a little bit of a, a, a ridge right in here that looks like a branch bark ridge, what you're really keying in on is the union between these two branches. And you can see that it's creased. It's like a pair of trousers, the crease in a pair of trousers there. That tells you that it's a weak attachment. And uh, in, in terms of plant anatomy or tree anatomy, this is called included bark. So this is bark that's included in the branch attachment. And again, no social life, bandsaw, lots of time, open it up and you look to the interior and you can see instead of that wood union being nice and solid and continuous up here, it's actually bark against bark all the way down to here. And trees grow in two ways. As you know, they grow from the tips and then they expand in diameter. So if you can imagine, as this is expanding in diameter and as this is expanding in diameter, they start pressuring against each other and now this weak attachment starts cracking down into the wood. That's the beginning of decay. Tree fails in five to ten years, sometimes even less than that. And it can fail in something as simple as a 30 mile an hour wind associated with a thunderstorm. When you're pruning, especially a newly planted tree, how far up should you start pruning right away? Okay, you're gonna hate this. Uh, depends. <laughs> So if, uh, <laughs> if, if you have planted that tree and you want it to become a barrier, so you don't want to see your neighbor's yard anymore, you're next to a highway and you're trying to tone down the noise from a highway, it's wicked windy in the area and you, and you want something that's going to block that wind more, then I would leave the branches as close to the ground as possible. So that's the first depends. The second depends is is it an evergreen, a conifer, spruce pine, or is it a deciduous tree, maple, oak? That's the second thing. So with deciduous trees, if you look at the total height of the tree, you want to, especially at maturity, you would like to have a bare minimum of 50% live crown ratio. So live crown ratio is you take the height of the tree, what percentage of is living has chlorophyll, has leaves on it. So if you have a 10 foot tall tree, you'd want at least five feet, the top five feet, to have foliage on it. If it's a 50 foot tall tree, you want at least the top 25 feet, at least. Now most growers shoot closer to a 60% live crown ratio. So a 10 foot tall tree, if you buy it from a nursery, they would like to see the top six feet with leaves on it. If you kind of follow that rule of thumb as you're developmentally pruning a tree, you're going to be really, really safe then. So as the tree grows up, you can look at it and say, well, I want at least 50% of the height to have chlorophyll, to have leaves on it. So this year I can remove these two branches or this branch. And then the next year it grows a little bit more and then you can lift more branches. So that's, that's for deciduous trees. Evergreens, like spruce, fir, pines, if you think about the way they grow, they're very pyramidal. So there's a disproportionate amount of chlorophyll, foliage, needles on the bottom part of the tree. So we never ever break the 75% rule on that, 75% life crown ratio. So a 10 foot tall evergreen, I don't know why you'd want to remove the lower branches, but if you do, you would always maintain on a 10 foot tall evergreen seven and a half feet, minimum of seven and a half feet of foliage on it. Should you leave even the lower branches on um, those first years, like the first year or two after you plant, in order to make more food, you know, have more leaf surface to make more food and get the roots established better before you take them off? Yeah, that's a really good point too, because um, chlorophyll is, is this, the, the point of energy can, you know, build up in a plant. So the more chlorophyll, the more energy that goes in the plant. Um, oddly enough, you would think more foliage lower down, it's gonna grow faster this way. It actually grows faster the trunk diameter. So the trunk diameter, if the more foliage you live, leave on a tree, uh, the greater the trunk diameter starts growing, which is what you want, a good solid trunk and the buttress roots. So the buttress roots, the main roots that come out the, that support the plant and the trunk, the more foliage you leave on, the faster they develop. The more you take off, the faster it shoots north. And you'll end up with skinnier trunks 
kind of wimpier root systems too. So that gradual removal is really kind of the key. And if, if the lower branches, when you first purchase tree, the lower branches aren't slapping you in the face, then leave them on as long as you can before you gradually start. Well, now here's the question of the day. When should a person prune? Depends. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, first, first of all, disregard the warnings about trees bleeding. Trees do not bleed. Sap comes out of pruning wounds, which is not blood. It, it's not going to harm the tree. Does it attract insects? Absolutely. All these little gnats, small flies will be attracted to it. It's no big deal. But what it's actually telling you is the tree is actively growing, and so it's going to seal over that wound really well. So maples and birches, those are the ones people are kind of have a fear about timing, don't have that fear. Have more of a fear of taking off too much at one time. That's what's bad. You get rid of all that chlorophyll. You take off half of all the leaves on the plant. That's really bad. You should never take off more than a quarter of the branches and the leaves on the tree, very gradually. Second thing is, is there oak wilt in your area? If there's oak wilt in your area and you're pruning oaks, you avoid pruning and uh, April, May, June, for sure, those are the high, high uh, infection months. So those are the danger months. Probably should even avoid July, August, September, and then do your pruning in late fall and through the winter. Because when you make a pruning cut on an oak, the, the, uh, the phenols attracts um, sap feeding beetles. And sap feeding beetles carry the fungus if they've visited an infected tree. That's how it gets into the tree. But if you absolutely have to prune, like some people are going to have to today because of the windstorm, within 15 minutes, just spray it with some orange shellac. You can put varnish on it. Uh, you can paint it if you want to change the color of the tree. I don't recommend it. Shellac is clear. And uh, what it does is it masks that odor that attracts the beetles. That's all it does. Uh, some people are a little bit nervous about pruning elms during the spring and summer. If you're nervous about it, as soon as you make the cut, spray it with slack, put some varnish on it, whatever you want to do, and that, pre that prevents the, the insects from being attracted to it. Would you be willing to actually show us and demonstrate how to prune some of the more common species of trees? Sure. I have a question. I have these mean scary bees in my yard. How can I kill them? Well first you want to be sure that you have bees and not wasps. A lot of people don't know the difference and that's okay, but that's part of my job is to make sure you understand what the difference between bees and wasps are. Most bees are not aggressive and they really just want to go from flower to flower collecting nectar and pollen and bringing it back to their hives. Wasps, on the other hand, are not herbivores. They're more likely to be carnivores. So they will go still from plant to plant, but they tend to attack other insects. So wasps are actually not as bad as we think that they are. Sure, they can be a little more aggressive than bees, but really any stinging insect, when it senses that its nest is in danger, will attack. So the best way that you can protect yourself is to give them distance, give them space. If you know that you have a hive or a nest nearby and you're able to stay more than three feet away from it, chances are you're going to be okay. However, with some ground nesting wasps or if they nest on the side of your home near your windows, you might not be able to avoid them. Any sort of vibration, whether it's from a lawnmower or walking or closing your doors or windows, that could really disturb them and send them flying. And when they fly like that, their number one job is to protect their young and they will do whatever it takes to do that. So if you are allergic, I really recommend that you hire someone to take care of the nest for you or ask a friend or family member that is not allergic because a, a reaction can happen very fast. If you are able to do it on your own and you can't possibly live with the wasps being close to you, then there are options. This is not a product endorsement, but there are many different kinds of knockdown sprays that come in an aerosol can. It sprays about 10 to 20 feet, so you don't even have to be that close to it. However, you want to make sure that you're only doing that in the evening hours when most of them are back in their nest. If you do it during a hot, sunny day, there's going to be a lot of activity and you're going to be more likely to be stung in the process. 
If you are going to use a pesticide to kill the wasps, make sure you read the label in its entirety. Some of these pesticides contain pretty harmful chemicals. If it's strong enough to kill a wasp, it's strong enough to kill just about anything. So be careful and make sure you're using it properly. For ground nesters, there are dusts that you can apply, which would also be uh, effective. You can usually find those at hardware stores or garden centers around. I do want to let you know that this entire time I've been standing underneath a hornet nest. So if you can look up there, that is a bald-faced hornet nest, which are really incredible workers. A cool thing about hornets, uh, bald-faced hornets rather, is that they are actually yellow jackets. They just look a little bit different than our standard yellow jackets. But like all yellow jackets and most wasps, they will not reuse their nest from year to year. This is a one and done type thing. So when it starts to get cold after we get our first hard freeze, I'm gonna take that nest down. I'm gonna let it sit in a cold garage over the winter to make sure that nothing is living in it still. And next year we're gonna use it for educational programming. They're pretty impressive structures. And quite frankly, some people say that you can even make money off of these by selling them online. Do make sure that they're dead first. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. All right, we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of pruning on this tree, and this is an autumn blaze maple. It's one of the Freeman maples, and the Freeman maples right now are about the most popular deciduous and shade tree in Minnesota. Since this is so popular, it's a good one to talk about. This is also one of the, the trees that, if it's not pruned correctly, uh, ends up with a lot of storm damage. So if, if you have an autumn blaze maple or one of these Freeman maples, uh, it's, it's really important for you to focus on that developmental pruning those first 15 years. One of the things to look for is, this is a good example too, right at the top, if you look up there, it's a single leader and that's what you want is to maintain that single leader. So anything that I think might compete with it uh, eventually should be removed or I'm going to suppress some of these two which is basically heading them back. This will get up eh, pretty reliably you know even in this part of the state where it's a little bit windier 45 or 50 feet tall. So I would like to see that single leader going up uh, maintained you know at least at 15 to 20 feet before it starts branching off. And then that's normal for maples too. They can start branching off. If you think of bur oaks too, they branch off at a certain height, hackberries at a certain height. Um, but essentially any deciduous tree, you would treat the same as, I'm gonna treat this, uh, a crab apple, um, uh, an oak, a birch tree. You're trying to maintain that, that single leader when it's young until approximately you think, all right, it, it's at a point now that new growth beyond that is not going to be so heavy. That's really what you're looking at. So a crab apple gets up maybe 15 or 20 feet. And if you can, if you can maintain a single leader up to three or four or five feet, it's not that much wood that develops above that, so it's not going to be very dangerous. A coffee tree will get up 60, 70 feet. So you would want to maintain a single leader, central leader, up to at least 20 feet. And that's proportionally, that, that is how you develop a good, strong tree, too. First thing on this is looking at what is the live crown ratio. So um, live crown ratio, if we look at 50%, right about in here, right about in here, this is roughly 50%, a little over 50% live crown ratio. And the way I figured that out is uh, I just stood off to the back. Um, if, if you are really, really... Um, exact about things just take a ruler and just back up a lot, uh, far enough so you can look at the base of the tree and the top of the tree and it hits 10 inches on the ruler and then on that ruler you drop down to okay i want at least of a 50 percent live crown ratio drop down five inches look at you know you're standing off the distance where it's at on the tree and you'll see it's right about in here if you want a 60 percent it'd be roughly down in here okay if it's a evergreen again, you want a bare minimum of 75%. All of these branches will eventually be removed, so we call them temporary branches. But like we talked about too, they have a lot of leaves on them, 
So they're photosynthesizing a lot. So they're really important for developing the caliper of this tree, the trunk diameter, as well as the buttress roots. The tool that we're going to be using on this, if I did need to remove, let's say at the top, instead of having that nice single leader, there were two or three of them, I would remove um, all but one of them, and I would use this pole loppers. And this one is just like a pruning shears. Just pull it like this. I, I love pole loppers for working, and this one's ex uh, you can extend at different heights too. You can also get these with saws. Uh, for young trees, I hate the saw part. You can imagine, look how flexible it is. So if you're trying to saw up high, all the saw is doing is just whipping the tree back and forth. So for developmental pruning, most people, all you ever need is, is uh, this type of pole loppers. So uh, the pruning equipment that we're going to use, this is it's called a hand shears. There are different uh, models of this. You can get left-handed, you can get regulars. Uh, you can get the swivel handles, which theoretically makes it uh, less, uh, less taxing on your wrist. I don't know if all that's true. Um, but this is how you hold the shears, is you never come down. Remember that branch bark ridge yep. we looked at earlier? You never want the cutting blade to go down into that branch bark ridge. First of all, you have this confluence of tissues in there, so it's not a nice, it's not like real striated wood, it's this confluence. And quite honestly, if you're gonna be strong enough to cut down through that, you're gonna to have to have forearms on you like an oxen. Um, <laughs> so you don't wanna do that, but the, the tree is actually telling you where that branch bark ridge is, don't cut into me. Because if you do cut into me, that means you're also cutting into the trunk, which means that's the beginning of decay in the trunk. So you don't wanna do that. So the way, the way you hold these properly is you either prune from the side like this, or the non-cutting part goes right into that branch union, and that automatically keeps you away from that branch bark ridge. Isn't that swell? It is. Now, um, is that the same thing as the collar? I've heard this term, the collar. Okay, before I show you the collar, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to remove this branch. You use, you know, holding the, the hand pruners in the right way, so I'm going to prune from the side, and by the way, if you find when you're pruning this off that, oh, you're having to grunt and groan, it means you have too small of a pruner. So then you would go up to something like, same thing, just the loppers. So you could take off larger branches with this. And then if you are shorter, um, you can get long-handled loppers too. So this way you can see, it can do quite a bit of damage for the, with the loppers on this tree. But also you can see by holding it where I did, there's the collar. And, it, you know, some people call it a stub. And this collar is kind of, it's real, real fast growing tissue. So there's the branch bark ridge. Here's the collar. It's kind of the swollen area at the, at the base of where the branch attaches to the, tr to the trunk. And the collar is wicked fast growing tissue. So when you prune, if you can leave as much of that collar as possible, like with this cut, that real fast growing tissue is going to grow over this wound and it seals it faster. And the last thing is when you look at this wound, does it look like a donut or does it look like a football? It should look like a donut. A good cut is gonna be a, a perfectly round cut. It's gonna, it's, it's gonna do the least amount of wounding and it's gonna seal over the fastest and therefore the least chance for decay to form. So do you mean by the football that the uh pruning shears has kind of cut and flattened it a little bit? No. It's usually because people will see this little stub and go, I don't like that stub. So they'll come in either with another pruners or a saw and they'll cut it flush to the trunk. It's called a flush cut. Do not do that. All I've done here is wounded branch tissue. If I flush cut it, then I wound stem tissue. I don't care if a branch, small branch gets decay in it. It's going to localize it there. Um, I don't want it to get in the trunk of the tree. So we can remove these uh, temporary branches if they want to, or if they're really annoying you, or if they're not annoying you, the other thing that we can do is, is called suppressing. So we can, instead of removing them completely, we can prune them back about a third or so. We can do a little bit. Don't get a calculator out for this. You can just suppress them. And what this does essentially is the energy that normally would be used for growing this is now going more towards the branches and the trunk. So you're just kind of moving energy around by suppressing it. 
And it doesn't matter if there's a little stub there because in another year or two, you're gonna remove this whole branch. Remember, you're keeping that 50% live crown ratio. So if this, if this tree grows, another, and this tree is growing really well, if this grows a, another foot or two feet this year, well then you can take off even more branches. And we have two, two branches right here that, you know, you could say, well, they might, they might be conflicting with the leader. So on these, again, you could, uh, you could suppress these a little bit, and I'll suppress one of them. You don't have to do it a whole lot, but just suppressing it like that, because again, this is, remember the six and a half feet above ground, this is only at six feet, so probably our first true branch to be somewhere up in here. So this too is a temporary branch. So all I'm doing on this, uh, and any of these other kind of vertical ones, I'm just suppressing them so that main leader still is going to be dominant. Um, these are still going to be photosynthesizing, helping the plant put on good wood. Um, and there you go. How about an evergreen? There's really only two things to, to think about on an evergreen. One we've already talked about, that 70% live crown ratio. So if, for whatever reason, you want to start removing lower branches, you know, if you, if you move one or two lower ones just for good airflow in there so the tree dries out faster, nothing wrong with that. Most of your evergreens have really well-attached branches. So you don't have to worry about the included bark so much with them. The other thing to think about is looking at the very top because with pines, with spruce, with fir, they can, again can throw out multiple leaders. Uh, right away, prune it back to a single leader and just keep doing that as long as you can reach it because that's, that's the way they're supposed to grow is with a single leader. The one other thing, I'm trying to convince you not to remove lower branches, but if you, if you think about the way evergreens are built, it's like a series of arms. And when you remove these lower arms, you're removing part of that structural scaffold, which means that when you get up in here, a snow load is much more likely going to break those branches because it doesn't have that support system further down. One other thing I'd like to mention, this is a tree owner's manual and you can go online and uh, just type in, let me see, tree owner's manual and this will come up. It was funded by the U.S. Forest Service so it's free. You can print this right off. It's an owner's manual for people buying a new tree. So how to get it home, how to plant it, how to prune. Everything we've been talking about is in here. Uh, just general care. So it, it's a nice tidy little manual and it's written for normal people so it's written in normal language too. I think I need a copy of that. You may have it. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for all of the great information that you have given us. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. I love coming out here. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm, shalomhill.org. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Music